We've got what's we call it a psalm for all time. So earlier in our series, actually only two psalms back, we had one, well, I called it in Psalm 31, a psalm for all seasons. Now this is only one word different to that, but there's quite a big difference in what it addresses. So psalm 31 was more about the cycles of life, so we talked about the seasons, four seasons, that it goes through, of life, but... And uh, the sort of cycles of life are something that came up last week, didn't it? And the, the cycles of work in, in our lives that God causes us to grow with Him. Remember that little cycle we had? But this psalm, so Psalm 33, is in a sense, it, well, it broadens right out to look at more of the sweep of history and many interactions between God and mankind and how God's steadfastness and love and power ensures that his plan will end up the triumphant one in the end. And a major part of that plan is that all good ends up with him and all evil is put away once all is said and done. So that takes us back to the end of the other series, doesn't it? How he divides everything out. So yeah, if you remember, yeah, that, he does a filtering. He does a, like he do, like he do with sheep, you know, the drafting with sheep. He, one way or the other. Everyone goes one way or the other. So that's a kind of loose generalisation of Psalm 33, but to put it in some kind of outline, here's how I see it, for those who are keeping notes on this. So verses 1 to 3, oh, here's the outline, that describes the praise that honours God, which, which again is a bit like the last psalm, you know, where it draws for us the goal from the outset. So it sort of puts the, the, cap, the picture first and then we go through the rest of it. Generalization. So then after that we have verses 4 to 9. They kind of group them together to describe the power of the Word of God and especially His power in creation. That's the big theme in there. As you can see creation and all that kind of thing. And I guess we can see that as His work to establish the environment in which that mutually beneficial praise situation can occur. So it's mutually beneficial for man and God. And God's Word is the organizing principle of all that exists. So that's why this theme keeps popping up in the creation context is his word because his word is what does the creating then in verses 10 to 19 they kind of describe the actions and oversight of God in bringing the world into the form that he's seeking so let's call that God overseeing mankind we'll give him that title there that's the bit where history kind of happens so we've had the creation and then history happens so that's kind of that bit there and then in the conclusion, 20 to 22, it's the faithful ones voicing their hope and longing for him to bring this all about in the end. So there you go. There's, that's one way to organize the thoughts in this psalm. There are many others, but I think this is the one that God has sort of laid on my heart. So, so let's see it all in context to really get the meaning out, shall we? That's the, what we want to get is what, it's, what he's really getting at. Verses 1 and 2. Shout for joy in social media, O you self-righteous. Praise befits the one with the most likes. Give thanks to social media with all your time. Make melody to it with the chimes of ten notifications. <laughs> Hang on, that's the wrong translation. Sorry. <laughs> Let me try again. Shout for joy in your income, O you rich. Praise befits the wealthy. Give thanks to your income with splurging. Make melody with, it, with a wardrobe of ten new outfits. Sorry, I misread it again. My mistake. I did, I did that not to be blasphemous, of course, but to hopefully demonstrate the folly of how it would sound to trust in those other things before you, the true God of the universe, right? Just, it's silly. Because while we would never communicate those kind of praises with words, the things I just read, why do we often communicate that in our actions? Do you think about that? We hang out for those responses to our Facebook post and we live our lives trying to get more money because we think th those things will bring us fulfilment. But that's a lie. These things are full of empty promises. I'm not saying never look at Facebook. I'm just, you know, let's get the priorities right. So let's read our opening two verses correctly this time. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Okay, so that's got the priorities right, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Only God is worthy of praise. 
of our highest praise anyway. We can praise people and praise things, but we're talking about the things that really matter. So here praise is in the sense of how we normally think of worship, like in a congregational context. It's the idea this. But we need to remember that worship is all of life, isn't it? It's, it's saying with our actions, wherever we are and we're, whatever we're doing, that God matters. So anything you do during the week is, can be worship if you're doing it because you're saying Jesus is number one. He and his standards are worth far more than anything else. And if that's our heart when we're doing our own things during the week, so our own things, you know, God's with us, but we're doing what we do, then if that's true during the week, then when we meet together, the worship will be just as genuine and even more glorious since there is a special uniqueness and blessing in meeting together to worship God. I don't know if you think that, but that's why he commands us to do it. It's a special thing to worship God as a church body. So this psalm starts out with that kind of recognition you know, and instructs the worshippers that expressing our praise to God is expected. So we should shout and sing for joy. It's okay to shout. Don't be too scared. <laughs> and we should play instruments as well, it says there. Now, I'm not sure how the other side of the churches of Christ, the other side, us and them, don't mean that, but anyway, um, so mostly the ones in the USA, how they justify their prohibition of musical instruments because that's... When people in America see us as a Church of Christ, they go, oh, you're one of those ones who don't play, mu- don't play instruments and all that kind of stuff. Because that's what they, a lot of them in America do. Um, and I, I don't know how they justify that, because this is pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. Use instruments. Even if you take it super literally, they should at least allow a harp and a lute or a zither or something. It's, I've tried to look up what those words mean. It's something around those kind of things. Um, you know, which are so similar to what they're describing there. But the other side of having instruments is that they can easily become too much. And I'm one who would argue that it's the singing of the congregation that God really wants to hear the most. So instruments should be seen as accompaniments to that. I hope you agree with that. It's easy in our little church, but a bit different on big ones. Um, so if the music from the front is so loud that there's no chance anyone could be heard, then in my humble opinion... I think we've got our priorities wrong. Speaking of priorities, as much as some people would prefer to be drowned out, I know. <laughs> I've heard people say that. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, concerts, church concerts and stuff like that are bad. I'm just saying there's a place for that. But in when, this kind of situation, I think what people are singing needs to be heard primarily. So, yes, I know music can be a tricky issue in churches. I've been a music pastor at another church, and there's always people with their opinions. But there's a, there's a little bit more in our psalm that can help us. Verse 3. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings and with loud shouts. There's, there's three things that we don't always do there, I think. Now, no, sorry, that's, I've got to be careful with that, don't I? Especially the middle one. Now, we'll talk about that. There are more issues here. Now, firstly, notice we are commanded to sing a new song. We're never commanded to sing an old song. Now, is that... Stirring anyone up? I hope not. Now, so no, in this church, we're not against old songs. Clearly, old songs have their definitely have their place, and it's very important. Many of the older ones that have lasted until today do teach great and deep truths about God and Jesus more than many of the newer ones, and they can have powerful and memorable melodies. That's, that's the ones that have been around that long. They just we just know them, so it'd be foolish to leave them behind entirely. Of course. And it's also important not to lose sight of our musical heritage. I think young people should be singing these songs as well, these old songs. So this is not to tell us not to sing old songs, because that's not what it says, is it? It doesn't say don't sing old songs, it just says sing new songs. So the point of the phrase there, is, therefore, is more on the other side. Don't denigrate new music either. Because we need to remember that old songs have remained, that have remained popular until the present time have done so because they are good songs. All, right, all the junk from 200 years ago is all gone now. No one remembers it. Not all the junk, okay? We won't discuss that either. But <laughs> I keep having to second-guess myself this morning, but I'll keep going. But as far as new songs, they haven't had the time to be sorted out yet, have they? They just keep popping up because people make money out of new songs. Not that that's a bad thing. But, of course, the proportion of good new songs will be lower than that of old songs, right? Does that make sense? But the key idea here, 
uh, can be maybe be expressed like this. We should always be seeking fresh ways to express old truths. So that's why Glynis picked, you know, that uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's, it's, it's an older, older song, but it's been refreshed up and changed a little bit. Just, it helps us have a fresh way to express an old truth. Because truth doesn't change, but the people and cultures do. So we've got to consider that. Now, no one speaks Akkadian anymore. Do you even know what that is? It's like ancient language. <laughs> So it'd be silly to write a song in that language and expect people to connect, right? Obviously. So in the same way, we should always be trying to stay fresh in our exploration of the fundamental themes of the gospel. That's the fundamental themes, just how do we express them? Which is where far too much modern music does fall down, if I may be candid. Much of it is too much, you know, Jesus, my girlfriend, as some have said, being too shallow and repetitive. And I guess we just need the filtering wisdom of time to sort out the good ones from the bad ones, perhaps. And notice we're also told to play skillfully. So yes, we're very blessed in our church. We have some skillful musicians. But, uh, and, and so yes, it is good to be a talented musician. But remember that being taught... Um, but sorry, I, was, I, did, I do remember being taught at some church music worship workshops in the past this phrase, excellence honours God which is kind of okay on the surface. But the more I've thought about it over the years, the more I've come to realise that I think it misses the point. So all things being equal, sure, being proficient in leading music and playing music is a good thing, of course. But if excellence honours God is the main guiding principle, which is what they taught as the main guiding principle, very quickly the real main thing gets forgotten and people get hurt and demoralised because they think they're not good enough. So the main issue is not ability... It's heart, right? Are you playing music out of the genuine love for God and faith in Him as a desire to worship Him? That's a question I'm asking myself all the time when I play. So as I said, I'm a former music pastor. I can tell you honestly that counts for far more than playing skill if your heart is in the right place. Sure, there has to be a minimum requirement for ability, but a band full of brilliant musicians can be a spiritual disaster if they're all just playing for their own glory but a band of moderately talented but genuine believers is far more honouring to God. I hope you will agree with that. So anyway, that's just my little hobby horse as a muso kind of guy. So moving on now to the next section in our psalm where the focus is the creative power of the Word of God. So that's creation and Word all together in this section here. So starting verse 4. For the Word of the Lord is upright and all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, it's interesting how verse 4 is set out there. Psalms often put two lines in parallel with each other, as they are here. And when that happens, it can often mean that the two things are being equated. Or sometimes it's because they're being contrasted, especially Proverbs is is a lot like this. Sometimes they're being contrasted or that sometimes the second one builds on the first one, takes the same thing and makes it even bigger. So, but in this case, it seems more likely they're being equated. So I'll, when I say they're parallel, I'll literally put them in parallel for you there. Those first two lines, I'll rearrange it just to show you what I mean. And if that's true, that they're kind of parallel, then it's interesting that God's word and his work are being paralleled as closely related there. You see that? So, and if we think about it, that's actually true. His word and his work are very much linked because God's word is expressed in his work. For example, when he created everything, how did he do it? He just spoke and it was, right? That's the power of God and he says it and it just happens. And when it happens, it's good because when he does it, he does it in faithfulness and it's upright meaning that there's no flaw in it and it's a perfect reference for everything good. So the things he does are good by definition because he defines he's God. He's the measuring stick for all that's right. What? Even when the world is so full of sin and death and rebellion, is that right? Well, yes, these things didn't come from God. They came as natural consequences for the rebellion of mankind away from that upright beginning. 
Yes, God loves righteousness and justice. But man, to whom God gave the management of, you know, of duties of the world, chose to go his own way following Satan because we had the, the, the power to do that. We had our free will. So that brought the whole planet, which was under us, in a sense, you know, in fact, the whole of creation, under the curse because we moved away from God. But the good news is, as full of sin as the world is, we see here in verse 5 that it's full of God's love as well, right? So in a sense, God's love is the antidote for the sin of the world. God's love becomes more obvious and desirable for those who love God when sin is the default setting around them. You know, if you see sin, then you're hopefully more likely to look for God. So to put it another way, it's the fallenness of the world that brings us into more focus of the need for and the presence of all the aspects of God's love, like his grace and his mercy, his justice, his wisdom, his personal care. So all those things have their source in God's love and are all more necessary when there's sin. Right? If you think of all the things I just said, his grace, his mercy, his justice, his wisdom, and his personal care, when there's sin, they're more necessary. So they stand tall as a beacon and a place of refuge for those seeking a better way than what the world offers. So there is a point in creation going the way it has, while God has allowed it to happen, in the big picture of what he's doing. So we'll see more of that creative operation of the word of God in verses 6 and 7. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, and puts the deep deeps in storehouses. Now it may have slipped by you there, but do you see the Trinity in there? Some of you may have. Because our God is Trinity. So he's Father, Son and Holy Spirit, for those who aren't sure what that means. And here's what seems to have become the standard diagram to illustrate that these days. When you look up Trinity diagram, this is the one that comes up. And I think it's, it's quite a good one. Now, I won't walk you through all the details of it, but it's something you can do in your own time. But just for some general ideas, um, for those to whom this is new, that kind of summarises God's who he is. But um, just ha- how it applies here, let me explain. So God the Father is the mastermind of the whole thing. He's the ultimate authority. And equal with him in being as God, but below him in authority, is his son, Jesus, also known as the word of God. And also equal with him in being, but also subordinate, is the Holy Spirit. And the word spirit is the same word in Hebrew and Greek as the word breath or wind. It's all the same word. So if you take verses 6 and 7 together there, you see God the Father coordinating creation. So you could imply that just because he's behind it all. Or you might want to attribute aspects of this to him, like perhaps he's the one who breathes there, maybe. But the God, God the Father is behind it all. And then in verse 6 you see the word of God who is Jesus. So Jesus, yes, he's the co-creator as God. And then who is in the second part of verse 6? Holy Spirit, breath of God's mouth, who's the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God, and also the Spirit of Jesus, all the same. So in some ways they all overlap, because they are all God, but they are distinct persons as well. The Bible teaches that. So that's why we've just got to accept this as the truth of who God is, and it's hard to actually explain it. So this is the majesty and the mystery of our triune God. One God, three persons, all working together, and all in perfect union with in which we call the Godhead. In other words, it's the Godhead. And like 2 Peter 3 verse 5 tells us, the earth was formed out of water and through water. So I guess we can sort of picture that our planet Earth began as a great ball of water, out of which God formed and raised the continents and the islands, causing the water to gather into the seas and so forth. So we're looking at the next bit here. So the creation themes in Psalm 33 can't be overlooked, can they? It's pretty pretty clear, especially in this little section. And so they continue into verses 8 and 9 as well. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. So can you see the tremendous power of the word of God 
as he speaks. Well, let me say it another way. Can you see the tremendous power of Jesus Christ? <laughs> yep. But I mean it. Can you, can you recognize it here? Because the ability to identify the true magnitude of the power of God in his words is something that Jesus honors in a person. Yes, it's something that the Holy Spirit enables in us, but we have to be willing for him to do that if our hearts are open to him. He will enable us to recognize it. And as an example of someone who was blessed because he was humble and willing enough to see the true power of Jesus was the Roman centurion we read about in Luke 7. And I want to show you this because it helps us see the kind of person who Jesus commends. So we'll pick up the story from where some Jewish elders... So if you've got your Bible, you can go to Luke 7. I'll be reading a little chunk of that. So yeah, the, he um, sent some Jewish elders. So he was obviously on good terms with the Jews, so they were happy with him. Um, they went on the centurion's behalf and they asked Jesus to come and heal the centurion's son. And Jesus is on his way to do that. And so we'll jump in at Luke 7, verse 6. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. So just comment. You see his humility just even in that, don't you? It's certainly an endearing quality before Jesus as well, humility. Then verse 7. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority where with soldiers under me and I say to one go and to and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard these things he marveled at him and turned to the crowd that followed him and said I tell you not even in Israel have I found such faith. Now, I always wondered when I was young, why was Jesus so impressed with what's, what's in that state, those, those words, that it impressed Jesus so much? Well, it basically boils down to the fact that the centurion knew in his heart, remember his beloved, son, his beloved son's life was at stake here, so he wasn't messing around, this was genuine belief. He had that deep conviction in his heart that Jesus' word came, coming from a distance was enough to heal his son. And also, as I just read it then, notice he says, um, for I too am a man set under authority. So he recognizes Jesus is under authority of the Father as well. So his understanding of Jesus is quite advanced, actually. But it's especially that idea that Jesus' word from a distance would be enough to heal his son. So in the same way, that centurion himself had the power to command people to do something, and he knew it would get done just by his word. So in the same way, Jesus could give, just give the word and it would happen only at a much more profound level. See, if, if he had any doubt, if the centurion had doubt, he probably would have said, you know what, Jesus is coming anyway, maybe, and he, maybe it's just safer if I let him come all the way and put his hand, hands on my son just to make sure, you know. But he, was, he trusted Jesus enough to say, don't come, just give the word. So no, his faith was strong, and he ends up being one of the most greatly honoured people in the Gospels by Jesus' own words, probably the most praised in, as Jesus was walking around. And he was a Gentile, no less. And that's a big deal for the Jews to... Got a Gentile got credited with that and no one else did. Which in a small way is a kind of fulfilment of the pattern in verse 8, back in Psalm 33, if you want to go back there now. One day the whole world will stand in awe of God, not just Israel. So yes, we should learn from this centurion's faith. God's word is powerful and we praise him for it to our own benefit. His creative and recreative power, like in healing, is immense. Okay, now we move from God's creative actions to the section more about his supervising actions in the bit we're calling God overseeing mankind from verse 10. The Lord brings the councils, counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plan, plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Now I believe we're living in a time where we can see the plans which will be accomplished during the tribulation, which we talked about earlier a few weeks ago. They're really, I feel like they're coming together. Now, caveat, we need to be careful. Don't put too much into that assessment since we can easily be disappointed if Jesus doesn't come according to our schedule. 
And far too many people have made those kind of statements and people get hurt and give up because they think, oh, you know. So it may be that everything forming will fizzle out again. That's possible. But by the same token, if we take Hebrews 10.25 at face value, we are expected to be able to identify when the day, that is the day of the Lord, is approaching. Which obviously requires that we know the things that happen in that day and can see the patterns forming and the plans coming together. And having gone through a bit of that in our big picture series, we are hopefully better equipped to do that. Now we know what is coming at the end. So when we see the coming together of a form of global government and the technology and systems already in place to bring it to pass, we have to sit up and pay attention or else we're effectively rejecting God's word. We're saying it doesn't mean anything. So with that said, it's good to know that whenever all this happens, and whatever the terrible plans of worldwide tyranny, whatever they mean in practice exactly, it's God's plans that will succeed in the end, not Satan's. Because these two verses really draw a contrast between those two ideas. I hope you can see there. So there's two opposing plans for mankind, which is captured in that word counsel there. So counsel carries the idea of plotting together, taking a counsel and having a meeting. So this is the other word could be conspiring, if you will, certainly if it's a bad thing. If you're trying to plan something bad, conspiracy, if you like. Now, are you worried about being called a conspiracy theorist? Because people use it quite pejoratively these days. They've designed it that way to make, it, make people like us feel a bit strange. But for me, they can call me whatever they like. The fact is, there is a great conspiracy going on, and there is a great conspirator. What's his name? Satan, yes. And he's been working on this conspiracy for thousands of years. Now be careful, like I say, we don't know exactly when that's all going to come to a head, but we have to pay attention if the signs are there. So it's important to note there are some crackpot conspiracy theories around too. So we need to be diligent to sort the good from the bad. But what do we do, use to do that? We use God's word to sort the good from the bad. So let's just do that for a moment, shall we? Because here's what we can see if we're paying attention. And I want to highlight this because it seems a lot of people are asleep on this stuff. So let's have a look. The world powers that be are openly calling for depopulation. So yes, the UN promotes this idea, clearly. As most of us know about Bill Gates and his ideas in this area. And the British royals, a few of them have said this kind of thing, and many others which at first blush might almost seem reasonable if you think this planet that God has put us on is poorly designed to sustain life. But if you put any thought into it at all, I think you'll realise the large, obviously, the large proportion of the world will have to die for this to be a reality of what they're talking about. To depopulate, people have to die. Which is exactly what Revelation tells us will happen in the tribulation, like in 6 verse 8. And its rider's name was Death. I'm talking about this horse. Um, and Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. So that's one part of Revelation. And then 9.18, a different time. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. So that's on top of the, the quarter that died already in the first part. And that's amongst many other verses. There's, as we talked about, there's a lot of death in Re Revelation. And, and okay, that's not depopulation the way they're proposing out loud. Or, or is it? Maybe there is some correlation there. But it is depopulation. Right, that's what's, hap that's what's coming. So that's one thing. Depopulation is something they're pushing. Secondly, have you seen this latest push from the World Economic Forum? You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Sounds like they should finish with an or else there, shouldn't it? It's just, it's just, <laughs> that's the spirit behind it. You can see that. Now let me just call a spade a spade here. This is straight out communism. And because the government will own everything. So if you don't own it, someone's going to own it. It's not going to be us, it's going to be them, the government. And they'll hold it back from those who don't behave themselves. So you know how the Chinese have their credit, social credit score? You'll have a similar thing and you'll either be a good little global citizen and get little mega rations or you'll be not. 
And that's the whole idea behind the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, 16 to 17. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So obviously the buying and selling in this case is just daily food and that kind of thing, whereas I think uh, the UN idea, or sorry, yeah, the World Economic Forum is a bigger picture about properties and all that kind of stuff. So obviously you can't rent food. So <laughs> just to harmonise these two ideas. So this is totalitarianism exactly as Nebuchadnezzar's statue in the book of Daniel points towards with the final ruler being the Antichrist. So to enforce this, they will need to have, of course, global surveillance and a tracking system controlled by a global government, all things that are well on their way to being implemented. And COVID has given it a real kick along in the last 12 months. But again, this is just what Revelation describes for us with the mark of the beast that we just saw and prophecies like this one about the beast, who's also known as the Antichrist, in 13 verse 7. And authority was given it, the beast, over every tribe and people and language and nation. So no one's left out of that. So that's worldwide control. So there's that. And then there's also the open attack on gender and families. The God-ordained building blocks of society, right? Which is rapidly gaining momentum now. And Romans 1 says much about this kind of thing. Like in verse 28, after describing the downward spiral of sexual depravity, Paul says this, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And these are things, especially in this last one, where believers in Jesus really must be pushing back. So for example, those change or suppression laws that Victoria has just agreed to bring in, it'll take effect in about a year, I understand, which um, effectively bans anything other than full support and enablement of ungodly and destructive gender theory. They're rumoured to be on the cards in WA. I um, haven't heard myself, but there are some who say that. I think Martin Niles mentioned that during the week, if you're on the, listening to the radio. So if we fail to openly stand against these kinds of things, we, especially while we still have the freedoms we do, we are failing in our mandate to be salt and light in the world. Wouldn't you agree? If we don't do anything about it, and it just comes in, salt's meant to preserve, you know, preserve, and light, light, like things in the truth. So yes, in these exceptional times, we have the gift of being able to stand for the truth in a very clear way. So think about what legacy we will leave. When people look back on our day, you know, will they say, were the Christians asleep or did they stand up? So keep that in mind with, like I said before about the election in three weeks away. I mean, that's just obviously one small part of it. This, there's ongoing efforts required as well. So yes, the conspiracy is well advanced, just as God's word, the Bible, warned us. But what the word does tell us in verse 10 there, going back to Psalm 33, is that this conspiracy of Satan and the world will ultimately fail. So you can go, phew, <laughs> God will take care of it. But it doesn't mean we're out of the, you know, got nothing to do. We've got stuff to do. And, and God has no trouble at all in tripping up the plans of evil men. Right? The Bible and history in general is full of such stories, and I've had time I'd bring a few because they're really encouraging. But God, you know, God just goes, takes care of that. But that's because God is all-knowing and all-powerful, but Satan is neither. So just keep that in mind. So God's plans will be the ones that happen. But the trick for us as humans is that he loves to use the plans of Satan and his own, in his own plans and turn them on their heads. That's part of, I think God gets a bit of satisfaction out of that. <laughs> I don't know. And the cross is the greatest example of that. What Satan thought was his greatest achievement, the death of God's son, turned out to be his greatest defeat. So that's the genius of God. I love that. That's great. Anyway, the point of this first part of this section is to set out clearly that history unfolds according to what God wants. And as we saw in the big picture series, he calls out people for himself through the whole course of history be that Israel or the church or whatever group he has in mind at a particular moment, um, which verse 12 talks about. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And hey, each one of us is part of that, right? If we're a believer, we are in that. So 
This is God's passion, to bring out of the world people who will love him for eternity. And he wants to use those who already believe him to do that as well. So that's where we have our role in the Great Commission and all that. But then God himself, he's always on the search to bring people to himself. He searches for them. So that's in uh, verses 13 to 15. God looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes, observes all their deeds. So God is watching us all closely because he, he's really invested in this world. <laughs> you know, He gave his life for it after all. And what doesn't come through very well in the ESV there in verse 15 is that he creates each one of us uniquely. That's really what the word says there. Each heart specifically. So your heart and mine are all a certain shape and we're located in a time and a place of history where he planned it to us to be. So nothing is by accident. So we can take confidence in the love and care of God in that truth. Not in the things the world trusts in, but, you know, but uh, which are uh, the things the world trusts in are addressed in the next two verses, actually, 16 and 17. So the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation and by his great might it cannot rescue. So I think between Psalms 32 last week and 33 this week, horses don't get a great rap, do they? (laughs) For those who were here last week, you remember that. But the point is that the horse was the pinnacle of military might in ancient days. And to have lots of them with lots of skillful riders was something a nation could really take confidence from as the, the great power you'd have. But in the end, the battle is not physical, is it? So did Jesus have a horse? No, he had to borrow a donkey. So it you know, shows you that horses aren't the be-all and end-all. And, and has Jesus conquered? You bet. Definitely. So it's something to think about when we try and allow ourselves to see things the way God sees them as best we can in our current situation. But God's eye is way more capable than ours, isn't it? Of course. So verses 18 and 19, his eye. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. So as we reach the end of the section highlighting God's overseeing and discerning eye during world history, it's interesting that the war bit is near the end and the final point is about deliverance of those who fear him. And without making too big a point about it, the word deliver there is actually better translated snatch. So I'll let you think about that one for yourself. But whatever our need, he will provide, be it food or salvation or whatever it is, he'll provide for us. He's our provider, Jehovah Jireh, right? So as we go to our final section, knowing this broad sweep of God's plan now, from the carefully designed creation through his intimate interest in it, our response should be to look to him and to expect him, both now and in the end. So verse uh, 20 to 22. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So this summarises a life lived in humble and expectant submission to God. So there's waiting. This is the kind of things we have in life, right? Waiting. There's gladness. Thankfully, there's a bit of that. There's trusting. And there's hope. Thanks for that as well. That's helpful. And through it all, there is help. And protection, and most of all, his steadfast love, or steadfast, ongoing, loyal, never wavering love. Just trying to expand what the word means. So that's what that he said is it's that love of God. Notice there's seven things there, just point that out. So just in those last little bit. So even just one of those things should be enough to draw praise from each of each one of us. But when you put them all together like that, it just reminds us that God really is the only one worth living for and dying for, should God call us to that. So there you have it. My prayer is that something that was in that psalm has helped you take another step closer to God today. 
and to Jesus this morning. Because as we've seen, it's, he's fully invested in this world, in his creation, and in, especially in um, making us more, more fully grown in him, I think. You know, to be spiritually mature lovers of himself, fit for an incredible eternity with him. That's what he's aiming for. Because he really is the solid rock, faithful through the whole journey. So then we'll close with that song, which helps us remember that in a minute. But before that, let's pray. Well, thank you that you are so invested in this world, Lord. You gave your life for it. You created it with your word and you sustain it and you work in it to bring us to yourself. And you will bring it all to an end in your time. Lord, help us not to jump too much at shadows with things that are happening, but help us also be aware, Lord, that what you've told us about the end is there and um, it's increasingly seeming um, to be sh- taking shape. Help us, help us to use that as motivation just to live our lives more for you and to grow in you and to help others to know you as well as the time does seem short. So we thank you, Lord, for the reminder and for this great psalm. In Jesus' name, amen.